Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Purang dhammang sanghang namasami So speaking about Maga Puja and the Awada Padimoka, which the Buddha described as the heart of his teaching, it's significant to see that it begins with three lines that all have to do with kama or action and the fruits of action. To refrain from doing evil, to cultivate the good and to purify the mind. And when the Buddha was asked what his teaching could be characterized as, he said it's a kamavada, which is a teaching of action. And it's an important distinction between a lot of the, um, the word religion is broad, and often we hear about Buddhism, and we think of it as uh, religion um, in the sense of the Abrahamic religions. But where he's, many of those often have a flavor of uh, ontology and a description of reality. The Buddha's teaching is different in that it's much more a system of training. If you, an education system for the body uh, and the heart and the mind. And even if you just look at the texts, just it's not that there isn't descriptions of reality and how reality functions, but in essence, it's page after page of the Buddha and his disciples telling us how we should train to alleviate suffering. And whenever uh, people would press the Buddha as to the origins of the world or uh, if the body was one thing and the spirit was another, he would say, um, did I ever say that I would teach you all these things? Um, and they'd say, no. And he said, I teach just this, suffering and the end of suffering. And this restraint in a teacher is astounding. And uh, the focus which it gives us in terms of not getting lost or distracted on this path. And this teaching of action is centered around the idea of kama, the idea that our intentional, volitional actions of body, speech, and mind bear fruit, and we can shift our trajectory through uh, this life, and we can, over time, shift our characters. Uh, the Buddha said, do not be negligent, even as a bottle fills drop by drop, even so one changes uh, through small actions, little by little. But kama is a tricky concept, and we can hold it in ways that are punishing and in ways that bring up fear. Uh, the Buddha often compared his teaching to a snake, where if you grab it uh, by the tail, it turns around and bites you. So you have to approach it, he said, from uh, carefully and get it by the head. And kama is an especially difficult one because it can be used as an excuse for blame and self-recrimination and that self-hatred which moderns are just so very good at. So to begin with, a central question that often comes up around kama is if there's no lasting permanent self in Buddhism, how can kama carry forward in a life or in traditional interpretations between lives? And this question is predicated on a false assumption that kama happens in the context of self. Whereas the Buddhist view is that self happens in the context of kama. That is to say that we have a continuity of habit pattern and craving. And one of those habit patterns is the creation of a sense of self. And that's useful to know because you might notice if you look carefully that your different selves have different voices. They're different habit patterns, but we identify them as the same one. So you might have a certain self that has the voice of your mother and then another one that has a voice of uh, a certain oily uh, seller of, you know, snake oil, basically, uh, Mara's voice. You have different selves. 
And the uh, probably best analogy, I think it was uh, similar to Heraclitus, where he said, you never step into the same river w uh, twice, a great pre-Socratic philosopher. And in Buddhism, Kama can really be looked at um, as a, a river. And it has eddies and certain uh, you know, formations, a certain place where the water maybe is in a bit of a wave. And we identify that as a fixed personality. But not only does the water moving through that river change every moment, but over the course of days and weeks and months and years, the eddies change, the banks erode, silt gathers. Um, and similarly, if you look at who you are now um, and what you were when you were a kid, those are two very different rivers. So this is Kama. The Buddha spoke about four kinds of Kama. He said there's dark, dark Kama, which is uh, Kama we create. Um, and the essential aspect of Kama is volition. It's an intention, intentional action. Accidentally stepping on an ant uh, is not Kama. But when there's intention, there it is. And that can go for something you say, it can go for something you do, and it can go for an act of the mind. And that's an especially interesting one because it's the distinction between a uh, thought of anger arising and which isn't common, that's just the past. Uh, you have no control over um, or very little control over what comes up like that. But calm is the buying into it. It's feeding off of it and feeding it and becoming drunk on it. It's steering your intention into that. So dark comma with dark result is comma that leads towards the suffering of those around us and that issues into our own suffering. And the Buddha gives uh, reference, for example, one who takes life is short-lived. One who is often angry is ugly. And uh, one who is often jealous is uh, I uninfluential etc. And it's not to say that every one of those is a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you know, you see someone who, okay, maybe is not that attractive. It's not like you can say they were angry necessarily, but it's, um, it's something you can see in this present life. How does anger look in a person? How does it look? There's bright comma with a bright result, which is comma that issues into uh, happiness, uh, good action, giving. There's a mixture of dark and bright comma, which issues into a mixture of uh, uh, basically result, and that's where most of us live our lives. And then there's neither dark nor bright comma with neither dark nor bright result, and that's the important one. That's comma to the end of comma. It's action geared towards the ending of all um, accumulation and uh, craving. It's the comma of the path. So, comma, the idea, it's similar to angular momentum. In a closed system, when you have angular momentum and you uh, skew it, if you touch it, if you create a um, out-of-balance action, there's an equal and opposite result. And so, um, you know, a central idea would be, yes, you perform a negative, uh, unskillful action and it issues into suffering. But this mechanistic conception is problematic because the Buddhists didn't say our present experience was just past comma. The present experience is made up of past comma and present comma, present intention, how you approach your moment, your mind, your life right now. And that's key. So one way is that the, the Buddha said that a negative action doesn't necessarily have to bear in this moment, a strong negative result. Um, he said that one with a broad heart and a broad mind, a negative action could manifest just briefly, just for a moment, whereas one with a constricted, narrow heart and shallow mind, a negative action could lead to great suffering. He compared it to dropping a pinch of salt into a glass of water and how it would change the whole taste of the water that's one with a negative, uh, constricted mind. Whereas if one drops that same pinch of salt into the Ganges, the river, uh, it barely changes the taste at all. So if we have faith that we're cultivating a broad, loving, boundless heart, um, this is a safeguard. This 
means the heart's brightness is its own refuge. There's a sutta called the conch blower where uh, the Buddha says basically that one who constantly lives with the thought uh, that act I took in the past will lead me to hell and nourishes and chews on and cultivates that thought will go to hell for that thought or for that action because of that thought. Uh, I'm not getting the words exactly right, but basically what it means is when we take a past negative action and just chew over it again and again and self-flagellate and it's a source of constant, almost feeding off of the the kind of comforting pain it gives us to feel guilty. Um, that is in itself, it's unwholesome. Um, there's a difference between uh, regret and remorse or guilt and remorse. And the Buddha said the proper uh, approach to take to that past kama is to say that was unskillful, but I can't undo what I have done and let it fade. And he said that just as a conch blower blowing in the four directions, in the suttas they blow conches a lot, um, would permeate and pervade out. Even so, the mind imbued with loving kindness, with compassion, with sympathetic joy, with equipoise, any limited action of karma does not remain there. It echoes and it fades. So this cultivation of the path of a broad heart is a refuge. The other uh, way of approaching that past guilt, which is so common, is just to realize how human we are and just acknowledge that. We are um, fallible beings and our stumbling is the path. It's just one mistake after another, but we move forward with it. And to acknowledge that you can never completely get clean uh, the floor you're standing on as you sweep it. It's always going to be slightly dirty as you're trying. And that doesn't mean you don't try, but forgiveness for yourself. And sometimes that guilt is so strong, though, it's not something you can kind of logic your way out of. And that's when it's really okay, if skillfully held, to bow to that suffering. And just Ajahn Panyavado recommends this, just acknowledge you're guilty. In some deep way, we all are. We're all stumbling, and what's to lose if just bowing for a second to our own brokenness and saying, yeah, I'm, I'm guilty in this way. I, I am broken. I'm not perfect. And let it just wash over you and disappear. And obviously that teaching has to be held skillfully. Uh, it's not a license to engage in more self-flagellation, but just that acknowledgement of our own humanity. And sometimes that uh, suffering is so deep you have to let it wash over you. You don't get to work on it. You get to let it work on you in a sense. The other really useful thing to remember is that um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn uh, wrote a book called The Gulag Archipelago about the gulags in Russia. And he noted that the people who, glue, uh, who, who glowed through their time there and how he managed to get through it was to recollect that, to try to use it as a, a reason to find how he could improve himself, to think, in some way, I am guilty. Um, and to move forward and think, how can I behave in such a way that I, I am, I'm really being perfect in here and now or as good as I possibly can be? Um, and I think there's something to that. And at the same time, there's also a moment to hold comma lightly and think of it as the past is coming to fruition now, and that's almost a gift from those behind you, from the people around you. And what are you giving forward? What comma are you giving into the world as a gift? And in that sense, your practice, every habit pattern you purify through meditation, every negative state you slowly let go of is moving through comma, is purifying into a gift you give onward. And the 
linchpin to this whole question of comma is neither dir- dark nor bright comma, the comma to the ending of comma. So often there's the question of what exactly this means. And basically it's any action you take with right intention, with right view, with right effort. Those three compose right attention. And namely this intention towards, as Bonte G puts it, may I uh, let go of the defilements in me. May I uh, cultivate Nibbana, the potential for awakening in myself. Any action undertaken with that intention and that view and that effort becomes transcendent kama. And this is the secret because what it means is that whatever lot we've been given in life, uh, suffering, happiness, wealth, uh, poverty, if it's approached with right view, it all becomes, in a sense, good kama. It can all become transcendent kama. They say that the Deva realms uh, and those beings who often are born rich or well off become heedless and they lose the path. And that's why humanity, with its particular mix of suffering and uh, mindfulness and enough faculties to practice the path, but enough suffering to not let us grow heedless, is perfect. And you read the biographies of so many teachers, and it's tragedy after difficulty after obstacle again and again. And yet those were the stepping stones that bring them eventually to awakening. Han Shan, a famous Zen teacher uh, in uh, Japan said that, or sorry, China, I think, said that, look, after a while, the practice becomes all pleasurable because if things are pleasant, they're pleasant. And if they're unpleasant, it's a chance to use your Dharma strength, which is pleasant. So, and another uh, suit or phrase I, I love, although I don't know if it's totally related, is um, I dreamt and thought that life was a joy. I woke and found that life was a duty. I acted and behold, duty was a joy. So this is the secret is wherever we are, um, if we can approach that situation with truly uh, the intent to make it part of our practice, then it becomes path. And this is um, especially uh, relevant for, I forgot what I was going to say, something. The um, neither dark nor bright comma it's easy to take that perspective that something's part of your path when it's good. But the reason that the Buddha put the first noble truth to comprehend suffering first is because it is the primary directive and it is the hardest one. So can you turn towards your quote unquote dark comma, the difficulties in your life, the suffering, the thing you think that if only my spouse wasn't quite like that, I could practice a lot better. If only my job or my boss wasn't quite as difficult, then my practice could, could happen. And can you turn towards that completely and realize that just where things are uh, most difficult is exactly where the heart of your path is and can you bow to that as your first noble truth? Um, Ajahn Yanako often says that uh, he will find the dirtiest place in the workshop and make it the cleanest. That's his practice. And similarly, wherever you trip, that's where you dig for treasure. This is where our first noble truth is and where the path opens. Through that dark valley comes the majesty of spirit. And you know those people in your life who have moved through it with very little acknowledged suffering and their hearts can be like porcelain. There's not a crack. And then you meet the people who've really confronted their suffering, who've looked to it and they have cracked open and they can touch you. There's actual compassion there that comes out. Um, I think it was Rilke who said that uh, uh, winning does not interest that man. This is how he grows, by being defeated by greater and greater beings. So 
can you turn towards the most difficult things and look at it as a chance to humble yourself? Richard Rohr says that after up to about 30 years old, you want some success. It gives you some self-esteem. But after 30, everything you learn will be from failure. And he has a prayer that every day he says, may I be humbled in, in one way at least. And in a sense, if things are going too well, our heart grabs onto them and we forget that this world is not a refuge. And so in a sense, this world is falling apart in its eagerness to make us look at what lies underneath. So can you hold everything in your life this way? Can you look at the difficulty or the loneliness as a real opportunity to, to grow and a reminder that this life is short and we do not have long to practice and it is the greatest gift we can give and this life is not a refuge. It is a chance to learn and a chance to give and that's it and it will not be that comfortable. It's human life. People die, we lose people and yet it can be such, such a gift. It's the perfect place. So can Kama not be a punishing hand but rather a hand giving you the exact lesson you need um, I know there's someone who said that instead of looking at depression as a fist crushing you, can you look at it as a hand pushing you down until you hit solid ground? So, you know, someone who's just speaking this morning about the difficulty uh, with loneliness and trying to find some a measure of, of love and the hunger for that and regret too. And can you find in that loneliness this universal human condition and find it in it a way to open to to compassion and this is the secret this is the strange alchemy of the path is to turn dark and bright all into transcendent comma so the next thing i think is just worth mentioning is that as practitioners we have to be very careful with our comma um, because you will notice it affects your meditation a lot. Those five precepts are not some, uh, you know, fire and brimstone admonishment. It's that if you break those precepts, you will notice in your meditation. If you speak unskillfully, if you kill, if you take, if you have any guilt or stain, um, it affects your meditation. And if you want a calm mind, a clear sense of morality is it's just essential. And there's a beautiful sutta called the Thief of Ascent. So it talks, uh, there's this bhikkhu, this monk, he's walking along and he sniffs a flower and the devada shows up, which had to be a bit surprising, and says, uh, stop being a thief of that flower's scent. And the bhikkhu says, what are you talking about? You should probably go admonish someone who's like digging up plants or, you know, actually destroying this. I just sniffed it. And the deva says, I don't have time. What does it matter if a dirty diaper gets a little more dirty? You are a clean cloth, and so I advise you, bhikkhu. And the bhikkhu says, thank you. Please admonish me further if I, if I uh, fall into fault again. And the deva says, what I am I, your servant? And the bhikkhu says, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'll take care of it. So I love that. <laughs> the devas, the angels in Buddhism, they always speak in poetry when they come, but it doesn't mean they can't have some sass. So... <laughs> So this is the case, is we are, as practitioners, um, you need to protect that comma carefully because this is a rare moment and you found something utterly precious and everything you can do to make that cloth of your heart clean, you should do. Um, and you'll start noticing when you don't. And it won't often be the metric of, bu uh, of good or bad as you practice, the metric between right action and wrong action often is beautiful and unbeautiful or trivial and non-trivial. And those are felt bodily senses. You feel what it feels like to compromise your morality. Uh, the Buddhist speaks about morality as morality that is unbroken, unspotted, unsplattered. And that sense of an unbroken um, cloth sort of points to the feeling when you break it and there's a sense of a rusty nail ripping through cloth. You feel it in your body. There's a disintegration. So can you integrate? And the final thing I think is worth touching on is just the central element of all kama is intention. And 
the aggregate, the, the place where the Buddha talked about intention is sankara. It's these volitional formations is the translation that's somewhat awkward. But it's like these habit patterns we dive into, that we move into. Um, these ways of thinking, these ways of behaving, um, kama. And sankara, this word, in ancient Vedic texts, it also meant ritual. So I think there's something to be said for can you make every sankara in your life, every action, every uh, habit thing, ha habitual way of interacting with your life, with your spouse, with your job, can you make it holy and a ritual in a sense? Because that's how you change it. That's how you bring mindfulness into it, into it and change it from just simply dark and bright kama into kama of the path, into transcendent kama. So you see, uh, we monks, we bow a lot. Um, in monasteries, we have to bow literally every time we enter and exit a room. And if you forget to bow when you leave your hut, you have to go back and bow again. It, it's intense, like hundreds of times. And it's not some blind ritual. It's a chance whenever you enter a room, you establish mindfulness. You stop, you kneel, and you remember your highest ideal of awakening. That's what it is. And the sense of stopping to bring in mindfulness and infuse a moment and the comma therein with transcendent potential is, uh, is basically what we have to do in our lives. And there are very practical means of doing that. Um, so make it into a, a, a ritual. Um, and often that means just adding a little bit extra around the edges. So on the edges of your day, can the first and last thing you do when you wake and you go to, s right before you go to bed, can it be to bow to something that you uh, consider your highest potential, an image of that? Um, when you, uh, once a week, can you take a Sabbath day, a new post it today, and turn off the entertainment, maybe take eight precepts if you want, um, give more time to meditation, uh, turn off the phone? Can you make your week sacred through that? Um, can you, uh, you know, one other uh, thing that monastics do is we ask for forgiveness whenever we leave a place or people. I do that with my parents. Can you make that a habit? Um, can you find these ways of infusing your life with a bit, with a certain sacred quality and bringing in mindfulness? And often how you do that with the people around you is so significant because the difference between a normal interaction and something really meaningful, uh, a ritual in a sense, is sometimes the smallest touch, the mint on the pillow, um, if you have mints and pillows to put them on, or you know, can instead of just taking someone's laundry out of the dryer, can you fold it? Like that's turning it into path, very concretely. And that's our task. And if you realize that there are infinite opportunities to do good in a day, to turn all these into path, then this life becomes a very rich ground for practice regardless of the exact conditions you find yourself in. Often these sankara, these rituals in the time of the Buddha would take the form of burning uh, an offering and hoping that the smoke reached the gods. And while the Buddha didn't approve of that sort uh, or thought it, you know, it didn't help anything, there's something to be said with taking this raw material of our lives and burning it in this fire of attention, of care, of path, and turning it into something truly heavenly, um, truly transcendent. So um, good luck to all of you, and yes. Okay, so we have a bit of time. Um, maybe we can do breakout groups today. And if people just want to turn to uh, two or three people next to them, and uh, if you're on Zoom, we will put you into breakout rooms, unless you run away, which people do. That's okay. Uh, and just if people could discuss for about 10 minutes um, where in your life you see potential for turning 
your actions and life into something sacred and path and how you let go of, of regret, which, which, whichever of those hits home more. Okay, uh, how you turn your life into the path where you see that potential or how you let go of regret, one or the other. Okay, I think that went well, except for one person in the Zoom who was trapped in a room alone for like <laughs> quite a while. Sorry, Teresa. Um, <laughs> so we have a mindful mic walker, or can we have a mindful mic walker? Allison, okay. Um, so if people just want to say what came up or any questions that came up, um, or just what they talked about, then please share. And if you're on Zoom, feel free to raise your electronic hand and we can call on you as well. Checking. Are we muted? Huh? Oh, apparently we are. Good. Oh, so uh, if you didn't hear that, Zoomers, uh, please raise your electronic hand if you want to share what came up in the breakout groups at all? Or any questions? Suze. And say your name, except for Suze, because I just said her name. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful talk. So what I shared in my group is I am a mother of an adult son, and um, it seemed like for many, many years, every time I went on retreat, I'd have all these regrets about all the bad parenting I did. And then about, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, I had that talk with Pete, um, sharing you know, how self-absorbed, how this and that, and how I didn't do anything right, and I kept on seeing in his life and his behavior the results of it. And so, I had prepared this whole long talk, and um, he looked at me and said, give it a break, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was my Dhamma teaching that helped me start giving it a break and letting that go. I think for parents, it's really hard because you see the results of your parenting over and over again. It's re-stimulated. The give it a break was really a gift coming back to me. So I just wanted to share that. Thanks, Suze. Yeah, Ajahn, Ajahn Suchita says, uh, people can't become enlightened. Chittas become enlightened, like our the heart, because our personalities are just, you know, kind of strange little things. So, yeah. Um, please, person, is that Joseph? Or whoever, whoever's raising their hand, please. Uh, unmute. Go for it. Sweet. Yeah, we can it's hear you. Go for it. Hi, hi. Yeah. Hello. Hey, I'm wishing you well. It's so good to see you. Um, I had a question about um, something you brought up in the talk. The, I've heard the analogy of the flower before, and I feel like it's a blind spot for me. Because uh, whenever I hear that story, I get I get a little neurotic. I get a little anxious because I'm like, Okay, smelling the flower is bad, but is looking at the flower bad because it's beautiful? <laughs> I know pick, 
picking the flower would be bad because I would have to destroy it, right? And so, like, what, like, could you clarify why smelling a flower is stealing <laughs> but not looking at it? Like, if I take a photograph, am I stealing <laughs> the image of the flower? Stealing the flower's soul, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Joseph. Good to see you back from Empty Cloud. Um, be well. Yeah, you might have to ask the Dave of that one. Um, I take it as... Uh, not so much necessarily a literal teaching, although I do not try to smell flowers now after reading it, um, but a bit more of this pointer towards the level of refinement we can move towards. And um, yeah, especially say that monk, you know, probably out in the wilderness was practicing quite with a lot of devotion and perhaps his mind was moving towards concentration. And when you're in states like that, you know, even small distractions really can can uh, alter the practice. Your mind is kind of looking for any way out. So it may have been given in the context of someone who is really, really at the, you know, a pretty high level of teaching um, or training. I, I think you're probably all right to take pictures of flowers, though. Um, and I, yeah, I wouldn't take it too, too harshly on that one. Um, but just their general ethic of refinement, I think, is the right thing to take from it. It's a bit annoying. Um, I, I hear another person talking about parenting and <laughs> can't, can't stop thinking about that. Um, so I've been kind of use, um, Pramrihansi. Uh, the four Brahmaviharas. Yeah. For practice, um, parenting, like Medha, Karuna, Motita, and Abeka, Obeka. But I um, was thinking a lot about Obeka is like, like when she say, um, when her, her son said, give it a break. And Obeka seem, seems like that, but it's like, when is that break? When should, should that break start? Things like that. Thank you. Yeah, so Nitnoy is referencing the four Brahmaviharas or boundless uh, emotions. So uh, loving kindness, sympathetic joy, compassion, and equipoise or equanimity. And asking, you know, when does equanimity become the right, the right um, approach? Um, and that's a good question. Um, I think it's something you have to feel out a lot. Uh, Ajahn Amaro says the difference between good equanimity and uh, kind of just numbness is the feeling of meh, like Upeka doesn't have any meh, uh, <laughs> you know. And I think it's good looking at the other words for Upeka uh, translations. One is watching closely. That's actually a literal translation. Upa means to approach and pek means to, to look or ik. I can't remember exactly the root, but it means like looking closely. So that sense of really looking and, and waiting for a moment when you can actually make a difference. Another way to look at it is it's kind of a grandmother's love, broader, sort of bird's eye. Um, and, and just that acknowledgement like a kid has to find, they have to stumble themselves, you know. In th that sense, Upek is even a broader sort of compassion because it gives them room to grow on their own. Um, but I think that is something, yeah, I can't imagine that's an easy line to find. And I think it's, it has to be intuitive and inevitably we'll mess it up, you know. If others have uh, any insight into the parenting thing, I, there's probably no one less qualified than me to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Is there someone on Zoom with their hand raised? Mary, please. Mary, if you have some insight, I would really appreciate it. Well, I was going to go on a whole different topic. OK, you do that. I have, I have no insight into parenting. <laughs> <laughs> one foot in front of the other as best you can. Um, thank you for the talk again. I wanted to ask you something about meditation, actually. In the beginning when, um, um, so here's my question. Um, when I get into a calm state, I noticed uh, um, that the thoughts that arise are really, um, uh, they, they are thoughts about 
people that bring happiness or something that may be a kindness I can do. And so I'm wondering how to work with thoughts. I mean, these seem to be the outcome of like a feeling of metta, mm-hmm. and then it springs forth into a thought mm-hmm. that is metta maybe an action, or maybe it's just a mind wander. So I'm just wondering how to handle thoughts that arise from beneficial states of mind. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. The, uh, there's a sutta where the, the Buddha really speaks about one of the turning points in his path was realizing he, he could divide his thoughts into those that led to suffering and those led, that led to happiness, you know, good and negative. But then he said also, there came a point where I thought, um, even thinking uh, over time, the mind and body become tired. Why don't I just let these go? And I think similarly, uh, for example, in the guided meditation with bringing up these recollections of goodness, um, like you continue to use thought um, until it naturally, uh, you can see the coarseness of it and it feels like it's ready to drop. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, people often make this distinction between vipassana and samatha, like insight practice and tranquility. But really, in, in some ways of speaking, they're one and the same because as the mind becomes calm by focusing on an object, say like metta or these recollections, it becomes more refined and then you see the coarseness, the dukkha of the initial object and you sort of let go of it and come to a deeper state of peace. And that's the Four Noble Truths, that's insight leading to deeper calm. So as those thoughts come up, like it's great to use them if they feel nourishing, you know, if, if they're really sustaining that brightness in the heart but if you start to notice, like, uh, they actually are a bit, you notice you have to do them. and That's it. That's it. Yeah, they, it lead, they lead into a thought of action. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and then even doing the thought, and you recognize, like, actually that glow in the heart is now strong enough, or maybe the breath. But there's a more subtle basis you can, you can let go and just rest in that more subtle place. Uh, yeah. Then you, you can do that as long as you can. But as soon as that subtle place begins to get a bit dry and you'll find your mind begins to throw up probably less wholesome fantasies or stuff to distract itself. That's when you bring in the coarse tool again of the, of the thought. And it's a refined tool, but if you can eventually let go of those thoughts for periods of time just to like a more refined object of the feeling of metta or the breath, then that's, that's good to do as well. Or nada, or nada. Yeah, or nada. Well, nada. yeah, that, the nada sound or just nothing. The, no, the not a sound. Oh, good, yeah. I mean, nothing yeah. would be good, but that's pretty, that's a high yeah. order, too, so. It goes into that state where you're only aware when you're it, dead or alive. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, so, yeah. Thank you, Thank Mary. you, Ajahn. Yeah. Thank you. We actually have to wrap things up. Um, so, uh, can we read the Blessing Braid and dedicate our practice today? Okay, uh, <clears throat> for Vlad, who died on Thursday after a terminal prognosis, may he find liberation. For Julie, new medical diagnosis, please share Meta. For Lena, suffering from Alzheimer's disease, please share Meta to ease her being. Shitipala, struggling with chronic illness, spread Meta. Sayapet, Sayapet, passed away of heart attack, please send merit to her and her family. Grandma Rita, Passed away peacefully with relatives at her side on March 3rd at the age of 93. Please spread meta to her. Puff has hyperthyroidism and chronic kidney disease. Please pre- spread meta to her. Thank you. Do we have any other um, people, names people would like to say that just bring to mind and dedicate our goodness and practice to today? Juanita? <coughs> 